Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I must, at the outset, thank Yakult India for inviting me here to deliver this talk and uh, uh, for kind words from Professor Lahiri. Probiotics and antibiotic associated diarrhea, something which we very commonly hear, something which will be different from uh, such a uh, futuristic talk which we had prior to this about use of probiotics, but I guess this is something which uh, all of us do here. I would at the outset repeat the definition what is a probiotic, because this is something which I repeat to make myself realize that live microorganisms which when administered in adequate amounts confer a health benefit on the host. They should survive stomach acid and bile, establish residence in the intestine, and impart health benefits. We've heard this time and time over again. I'm not going to repeat, but just basically symbiotics, which contain both pre and probiotics. And you have a list we have gone through since yesterday, a list of probiotics which are in use. The uh, initial intentional probiotic use, you see the photograph of uh, Professor Meknikov, how he had used it, and how he ended up utilizing it in so many places. Probiotics, just briefly, the colonization at birth with maternal species, species-specific organism by age in first year, becomes established by year one. And the probiotic species-specific organism are so good that each individual has got its own probiotic nature. You can actually see it like the lines on your hands or a genetic makeup. Scientifically, it has been proven that after reviewing a majority of research and literature relative to probiotic use in humans, it is clear that diarrhea is the condition most beneficially treated by probiotic therapy. This can include diarrhea associated with antibiotics, traveler's diarrhea, gastroenteritis, lactose intolerance, IBD, and these are the areas which I guess in this symposium which will be reviewed. Diarrhea per se, I don't have to define, but it's frequent loose stools along with excessive loss of fluid and electrolytes. It can be acute or chronic. You have these various kinds of diarrhea, osmotic, secretory, inflammatory diarrhea, motility associated diarrhea. And probiotics seem to be working at all levels. How it works, probiotic mechanisms for prevention or treatment of diarrhea, it protects the intestinal epithelial barrier where you have so many of these probiotics which are known to help lactobacillus, acidophilus, thermophilus, prevent intra-invasive E. coli disruption. BSL-3 is known to cause tightening of the junctions in salmonella infection, and so many more. Regulation of intestinal epithelial homeostasis, uh, the inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, which are down-regulated, especially by lactobacillus cassei. And you have the others also which show that. What I'm going to focus will be on regulation of intestinal microbial environment, where disturbance in the balance between the host and commensal bacterial flora in GI tract is associated with antibiotic-associated diarrhea, also with fungal infections. And you have various probiotics which are known to help. There's also this mechanism where there's modification to commensal and probiotic bacteria to enhance diarrhea prevention. Basically, there's a toxin receptor blockage which is created by the probiotics. So this is, in general, the mechanism which leads to protective part of probiotics in diarrhea. Hence, it affects in most, most of the places. And uh, it's very easy for us to conclude and say, with, when we study a few uh, of these papers, like you have the lactobacillus GG, Saccharomyces boulardii significantly reduced the incidence of antibiotic-associated diarrhea from 18.9% to 5.7%. Combination with susceptible antibiotics decreased recurrence of C. diff infection. You have during antibiotic treatment, reducing the frequency and duration of episodes of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Antibiotic use, or up to eight or even say 10 weeks after antibiotic discontinuation. Its incidence has been noted to slowly increase over the past few years. I guess that's because of our injudicious use of antibiotics, reaching up to 30% in some instances. Symptoms can vary from mild self-limiting disease to a more serious C. diff-associated diarrhea. Luckily, C. diff-associated diarrhea is responsible for only an estimated 10 to 20% of cases of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Multiple risk factors have been identified. I'll highlight them later. And your sign and symptoms common 
if you have mild symptoms, it's only loose stools and or more frequent bowel movement. But the more serious symptoms would be where you have frequent watery stools, abdominal pain, fever, mucus in stools, bloody stools, nausea, and loss of appetite. Antibiotics most likely to cause diarrhea. I think they're all antibiotics which can cause antibiotic associated diarrhea. But yes, we have got some of them which we have kind of isolated them. Cephalosporins, clindamycin, penicillins, macrolides, fluoroquinolones. The, this is a question which is asked that what is the major infectious agent in antibiotic associated diarrhea? Is there an infectious agent? But what has been studied is that you have candida overgrowth, which is there. You have Clostridium perfringens, which is there, Staph aureus, Klebsiella oxytosa, and C. diff, of course, which is 30% of the antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Candida overgrowth should not be confused as a causative agent. There's no causative role. The result of antibiotic treatment and diarrhea per se causes anti candida to be present. Enterotoxin producing C. perfringens, the commonest cause, common the commonest cause of food poisoning, can be accepted as a causative agent, provided a person tests negative for C. diff. You should think about it because this also can cause antibiotic-associated diarrhea, similar to C. diff. Enterotoxin producing Staph aureus also can be considered similarly if a person is negative for C. diff. And it should be considered because the treatment for the same changes. Klebsiella oxytosa, something new which we have heard, which causes antibiotic-associated hemorrhagic colitis. First described in 1978, but yes, it should be something which should be considered when you have C. diff, which is negative. This is how it looks like, something very similar. We see it quite often, mostly affecting the right side of the colon. The most ominous form of antibiotic diarrhea is the Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. 20 to 30 percent of antibiotic associated diarrhea is included in this. The toxin is detectable in stool, onset during or within 10 weeks of antibiotic use, and it's associated with all antibiotics. Four categories of colon appearance. You could have normal colonic appearance, mild erythema, granular friable hemorrhagic, or the pseudomembrane formation, the classical pseudomembranous colitis. And similarly, you have the diverse clinical symptoms, which may be profuse watery diarrhea, blood or mucus, abdominal cramps. Large number of RBCs and WBC stools, and 95% are positive for stool toxin, the C. diff toxin. This is the classical pseudomembranous colitis, which is seen with C. diff-associated diarrhea. The complications of C. diff-associated diarrhea, you have pseudomembranous colitis, toxic metacolon, perforation, sepsis, and death. So it's, it's not something very nice. And I guess you have to identify this risk group. And this risk group would be people who have had prolonged antibiotic exposure, GI surgery or manipulation, long length of stay in healthcare setting, infected roommates, comorbid conditions, immunosuppression, advanced age, and yes, the something new is the use of excessive use of PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, which also makes them pro to the same. And I've already covered about the antibiotic-associated diarrhea. For C. diff-associated also, you have more frequent cephalosporin, ampicillin, glinda, penicillin, macrolides, tetracycline, and trimethoprim sulfur. Even metronidazole, which is a drug used for the same, is less frequently would be there as a cause. Management of C. diff-associated diarrhea would be enhanced infection control measures, targeted antibiotic restriction, appropriate antibiotic therapy, adjuvant therapy, probiotics is what we'll talk about later, IV globulins, avoid antiperistaltic and opiate drugs, and fecal transplantation. I'll move. Now, since we know what antibiotic-associated diarrhea is, and we know that probiotics are the most effective agents for controlling diarrhea. Before we come to a conclusion, it's good to just go through the various studies. This is just a systematic review of nine placebo-controlled studies, two in children, using various products. 60% reduction in incidence and duration of antibiotic-associated diarrhea compared with placebo. Uh, this is from 2007 and 2002. How did they arrive at this conclusion? They presumed, and they had known that probiotics promote increased production of synergistic bacteria, thus decreasing the number of available receptor sites where the toxin could be causing. But reviewing more literature is what I have done, and this is what I'm just presenting. 
In 1989, the largest study of antibiotic-associated diarrhea and probiotic intervention was completed. This spurned more interest in the area. Prospective double-blind placebo-controlled trial with a number of 180 hospital patients on antibiotics was seen. Uh, they received Saccharomyces boulardii in conjunction with antibiotics. And the results, there was a 13% decrease in overall diarrhea symptoms when comparing the experimental to the control. 1999, 10 years down, a study using clear dosage level was published. It examined 119 children, two weeks to 12.8 years, on antibiotics. Half are given placebo and half were given 2 into 10 raised to 10 CFE units of lactobacillus GG twice a day. This was examined over a three-month period. During this time, careful stool frequency, consistency, and logs were maintained by parent and the subject. There was an 11% decrease in diarrhea in the initial two weeks of probiotic therapy. And by the third week, there was a 30% decrease in between the two groups, which is majorly significant. The study in 1989 was lacking clear quantifiable values of probiotic dose. But the study in 1999 gave us standardized amount of probiotic given. In all the studies reviewed concerning antibiotic-related diarrhea, there were one or more following confounds, lack of specific detail of amount and consistency of diarrhea, and the quantity and viability of probiotic strain. That's something which we have to really consider. So which organism to use, Saccharomyces boulardii, Lactobacillus, LGG, which product, what dose, how long, side effects, costs. But reviewing more literature now, the Cochrane meta-analysis of over 2,000 individuals where 10 random RCTs on probiotics significantly showed probiotics significantly reduced incidence of antibiotic-associated diarrhea, risk ratio of 0.49, which is very good. Efficacy of probiotic varied with dosage. A study of, this is by Gao et al., a study of 255 indoor patients who received two capsules of 50 billion CFU of live organism, L. acidophilus and Kezai, had lower antibiotic-associated diarrhea, that's 15%, versus those receiving one capsule, which is 28%, versus placebo, 44.1%. This is a study from, two, from Gao in 2010 and was reviewed by the Cochrane Review. In a 2013 Cochrane Review about C. diff-associated diarrhea, 23 trials investigating 4,213 adults or pediatric patients receiving antibiotic therapy. Prophylactic probiotic therapy was associated with reduction in development of C. diff-associated diarrhea. 2% versus 5.5% in placebo. Multiple recurrence of C. diff-associated diarrhea. Any person who has had once has a high incidence of recurrence, up to 45%. And many empiric treatments have been advocated, vancomycin, probiotics, passive treatment with immunoglobulins. But this was a study which talked about using Saccharomyces boulardii with a higher dose of, of vancomycin and comparing the two, 50% versus 16.7%. Significantly benefit achieved with the addition of probiotic. But this is a study which is looking at the other side of probiotics. The biggest trial, the Placide trial, Lactobacillus and Bifidobacteria in prevention of antibiotic-associated diarrhea and C. diff diarrhea in older inpatients. Professor Setu Babu had just mentioned about the same trial. This was a multicentric, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, pragmatic efficacy trial of inpatient aged 65 years and older and exposed to one or more oral or parenteral antibiotics. A computer-generated randomization scheme was used to allocate participants in one to one ratio to receive either a multi-strain preparation of lactobacilli and bifidobacteria with a total of 6 into 10 raised to 10 organism one per day for 21 days, or an identical placebo. The primary outcomes were occurrence of antibiotic-associated diarrhea within eight weeks and C. diff-associated diarrhea within 12 weeks of recruitment. Of 17,420 patients screened, 1,493 were randomly assigned to microbial preparation group and 1,488 to placebo. Antibiotic-associated diarrhea, including C. diff, occurred in 159 patients, that's 10.8 percent, participants in the microbial preparation group, and 153, that's 10.4 percent, participants in, in the placebo group. C. diff-associated diarrhea was un, an uncommon cause of antibiotic-associated diarrhea and occurred in 12, that's only 0.8 percent, participants in the microbial preparation group, and 17, 1.2 percent in 
patients in the placebo group. Very small number. So what was the interpretation which the authors, Allen and Hall, had said? That we identified no evidence that multi-strain preparation of lactobacilli and bifidobacteria was effective in preventing antibiotic-associated diarrhea or C. diff-associated diarrhea. And this is something totally contrary to the prior study from the Cochrane meta-analysis. The only thing was that an improved understanding of the pathophysiology of antibiotic-associated diarrhea is needed to guide future studies. But yes, there were some flaws in the PLASI trial. Antibiotics were given up to seven days before randomization. Probiotics should ideally be given at the same time. They use a usage of random effect analysis instead of fixed effect analysis. If they had, they used a fixed effect analysis, the results might have been different. The power of the trial actually, which was 80% based on a 50% reduction of C. diff associated diarrhea, assuming 5% placebo effect, but the placebo effect was only 1.2%, which actually reduced the power of the entire study. And yes, other probiotic strains with proven efficacy, especially Saccharomyces boulardii, should have also been considered. We have a study which had really proven in 2009 how effective it was in C. diff associated diarrhea. So to conclude, based on these meta-analysis and the, the famous Placide trial, there is basis to believe that probiotics through competitive exclusion by enhancement of intestinal microflora are able to lessen the frequency and duration of diarrhea. <coughs> Benefit of probiotics is thought to derive at least partly from recolonization of GI tract with normal non-pathogenic flora rather than from species-specific effect. These results are in accordance with the placide trial and suggest that probiotics use may benefit in adults but not necessary in the older age group. More needs to be done in order to create clinically applicable recommendation. However, what the PLESI trial does point out is that there is no clear evidence for us to use probiotics in setting until high-quality RCTs are conducted. Although we have been very successful in decreasing host susceptibility in recurrence of C. diff with fecal transplantation, currently no modality exists to improve the host immunity to prevent C. associated diarrhea. Hence, the primary Prevention with rigorous infectious control program remains the strongest tool to, to decrease the rate of C. diff associated diarrhea in hospital patients. These interventions have proven to be effective wherever implemented, including all safety pr procedures, hand hygiene, and everything. My final slide. The appeal to use probiotic comes clearly from their ready availability, low cost, and acceptably known safety profile. With the current data at hand, it is difficult to draw any solid conclusion about prophylactic use of probiotics and antibiotic-associated diarrhea. It would be reasonable to advise their use in some specific population. I talked about the high-risk group, such as patients with history of antibiotic-associated diarrhea, that is, recurrent CDAD, or risk factors for the development of CDAD. Fecal transplantation, which we talk about so much, has been used to treat recurrent C. diff infection, and as such, could actually be considered the ultimate probiotic. <coughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bhalla. Uh, that was a good presentation, and I'm happy you brought up the topic of fecal transplantation because that's very much in the discussion nowadays. And of course, with the latest ISPAGAN guidelines, which are going to come in. But I think there's a promising role, though, with a grade 1A e recommendation which is happening with AADs in children or in adults. Yeah. I think we'll take a seat. We'll finish the other talks.